So I'm interested in, in meditating more, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if there are any specific kinds of meditations that have been shown to, or like if there's meditations that are um, aimed at doing certain things or changing certain things, or like which meditations are best? Work so best. Yeah, totally good question. So when I got into this, learning about this work, I assumed that I would have a specific answer to your question, that certain ones would be like better than others. My read is that the data are like, any way that you shut off your mind wandering and that you do it as a practice, like you do it for some amount of time, not like once, but like regularly every day, like has a lot of these same effects. The difference is in kind of the nuance. And so for more, if, if your goal is kind of more social connection, more gratitude, some of those loving kindness sorts of meditations work a lot. Um, if your goal is kind of noticing more things like body sensations or kind of getting more in touch with your body, your healthy eating or that sort of thing, um, these kind of body noting practices or like body scan it's often talked about is good. You kind of think about the different parts of your body. And for all the cognitive ones, there's more nuance to doing the kind of breath or this sort of noting practice where you're like, note, you stay with and you know all your external experiences. But the upshot is that all of them seem to do a lot of the things. Like, the, I mean, you saw in those data, I think Cobra and colleagues were really looking to see, okay, which one of these is gonna shut off the default network? And the answer is they kinda all do. And I think they all do for the right reason, which is like, anything you can do to just focus on one thing in the here and now, no matter what it is, is gonna like shut up the scatter that is your mind. And it kinda almost doesn't matter what you do. So there's like some nuance. What, what I would suggest is that try different ones and see which one sticks. I'm terrible at the thinking about the breath. It's just kind of super boring for me. So it takes a lot more work. I'm much more into the like kind of choiceless noticing of what's going on. And I kind of dig the loving kindness. It's like sort of like cheesy in the right way for me. Is there any evidence that yoga has some similar effects? Yeah, so I didn't present that because it, it ends up being um, kind of a combination of the meditation part and some of the physical exercise part. And so if you do yoga in a way that you're really focusing on your breath and doing like doing a meditation practice as part of yoga, where you're really kind of like in the here and now focusing on that stuff, it can have similar kinds of effects. Um, I say the if because some people do yoga and they're like, like power you, you know, they're different forms of it. But if you're really focusing on your breath and getting in the here and now, you can do that stuff. And this is, this is also true so that that, you know, we, we think of the meditation of, you know, I'm, I'm like sitting, you know, on a meditation cushion and doing this. You can actually meditate in all kinds of different ways. And exercise is a really good one. Um, some people talk about like training for a marathon and stuff. And they claim that like when they're training for a marathon, their, their head is empty. Like they're just in here and now. And they're just like focusing on the steps of their feet hitting the ground. If you can do that in anything that you do functionally, like anything you can do to kind of force yourself to be in the here and now and focus, in some sense is a form of meditation. That's why I kind of left the definition so vague. Um, some people do like walking meditations where you walk around and pay attention to your breath. Like I think the key is to kind of figure out for you what shuts off that mind wandering. And it can look really, it doesn't have to look like, you know, you on the cushion, like with your fingers like this. It can look like all kinds of different things. And, and yoga is definitely one of them. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Um, some, okay, I have kind of like two questions. Um, <coughs> One of them was kind of like the being motivated and kind of like finding ways to kind of like motivate yourself like throughout the day. So like, like an idea I had was that like I could put up like a poster of like, like some motivational quote that like inspires me or like a picture of like some motivational person. But then I felt I, like I'd have to get like a lot of posters because then I'd get <laughs> used to like that poster of like I'm like, motivated, motivated like two weeks in and as I have to keep buying posters, buying posters, it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. like, it's this weird, like, getting used to thing. That's something I wanted to, like, ask about. And two is a question just about, like, sleeping. So, uh, according to this, um, I have, there's, like, an app that I use that, like, kind of tracks my sleep. And it says, like, my average is around, like, five hours, which apparently is deprived, so I'm kind of That's sure. sleep deprivation, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, like, <laughs> like, I don't really know, like when I when I'm like it's like say it's like one o'clock and I have like a, a ten o'clock class I'm like I have to finish this reading I have to get this thing out of the way I have to send out this email I have to get like I know like I know that I should be getting seven hours but I I can't I feel really anxious if I like go to bed and just ignore all that I don't, yeah. like like I feel like if I was going to make this seven hour thing a reality I have to like 
I guess I'd have to make a huge like life shift or something, and it's just really like ominous, and I can't really get around to doing that. I'm just yep, like, yep, just yep. Yeah. <laughs> Spoken like a second semester senior. Who knows? Yeah. Serious, yeah. I made that shift. Yeah. Sophomore year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I think, look, there's something that the whole point of telling you this stuff, I mean, you said you're going to have to make this huge life shift. Like, this is what this is about, right? Like, you didn't walk into here. You walk, many of you walked into here thinking that the stuff I started with should be the priorities, right? And I'm telling you that, like, those shouldn't be the priorities. The priority should be, like, having time affluence, like having time to just go sit around the courtyard and think. It's having time to spend a half hour every day thinking about nothing but your breath and meditating, right? It's getting out of this focus on like being perfect at your grades and worrying about accolades. It's like having the time and the space to hang out with your friends and do acts. Like, like this is a, this is meant to be a big life shift, right? And so it, a lot, following a lot of these suggestions is gonna be like a restructure. It's gonna feel like a paradigm shift to a certain extent. So like, yes, it's gonna be a paradigm shift, I guess is the answer. D or I guess doing this right to see these benefits is gonna feel like that. That said, on a local level, what can you do to do that stuff? My guess is a few things. One is try it. Like try the idea of like just not doing that stuff before you go to bed and get some sleep. People are having really horrified reactions this week, you know. But like try it. If you're too anxious before you go to bed, get your little insight meditation thing and like play a sleep meditation. And and, and literally the sleep meditation will be like, all you gotta do is sleep. You're like this is your time. Like take, and then see what happens. Like my guess is your grades won't go down as much as you think. My guess is you'll wake up, if you've been getting five hours a night for most of your time at Yale, you'll wake up with like the kind of cognitive efficiency that you've like never <laughs> experienced before. It'll just be like you like on like brr. And like you'll be like Superman and you'll get that stuff done. But I think it, it takes like a, it, so I would say as, as a first pass, try it and see. Um, and then, you know, go from there. But, but it is gonna take a big restructuring and stuff. On the poster thing, I think you don't need to like buy all the posters um, unless you want to, but, but your intuition is right, which is that um, changing your environment so you see this stuff matters in all the ways we said, visualizing it, having reminders, all that stuff is good. Um, and you don't want the reminders to get stale, right? Because if you do it, you know, if it's the same reminder every day as we saw, you just won't notice it. And so I think this is where you guys are good at this stuff, right? Because you guys know about technologies that's not just like putting a big poster on your wall. You know ways to digitally intervene on yourself and all the cool apps to do this, right? So I would say more powerful than a poster is like imagine you set a reminder to yourself to like change your desktop background like every few days, you know, or just like every Monday morning when you get up, you put another icon on your desktop that you notice. And you guys know apps that will like ping you in your Google Calendar or whatever calendar thing you're using to like get you to do this, right? You guys are good at harnessing technology to do that stuff. But I think that's the intuition is like you do want to change it or you're going to get stale about it. Um, having it there in a form that you will notice it is useful. Um, for me, again, poster on my wall would be less effective than like in my background on my phone. You know, the phone, the phone screen that you swipe every day and stuff like that. Um, but it's pretty good. But I think like use, get creative about your use of technology. And I bet you guys, because you know this stuff better than I do in my old age, will know good ways to do that. I just wanted to comment. Um, I think it's not necessarily a choice between like sleep and doing all of your work. I think there's a lot of other stuff you do that takes up your time. Um, so yeah, just like prioritizing is, which is like the hardest thing for me, like yeah. picking what I want to spend my time on, but, but yeah. And this is the thing is I think, I think if you do that, it's really wonderful advice. I think you'll learn two things. One is you're just gonna see that your default, if you really kind of non-judgmentally try to figure out is that helping you might not be. Right, and I have this in spades. Like there are many nights that I'm stressed and I come back and I'm like, I just wanna like watch something dumb on the Netflix. Or I just wanna, even worse, like I wanna scroll mindlessly through random links on the internet. And it's like, and none of that, and I'll do that for like, I mean, if I just stopped doing that, I would have two extra hours of sleep a night, really, right? But like if you look non-judgmentally, I was like, what am I getting out of that? Like. I'm at my like lowest point in flow, right? Like I'm low arousal, low challenge. I'm probably by myself when I'm doing it. I'm not getting any social connection. I'm not sleeping. I'm not, there's an opportunity cost. I could be meditating then. I could be exercising. I could be 
doing something else productive and so on. So, so part of it's like non-judgmentally looking at what do you get out of this stuff that you're spending your time on? That's point one. But point two, when you take that suggestion is I think you'll just be like, I don't have enough time. Like, you know, I have all these activities, I have these things I've signed up for, I have these obligations. And that's where you really just need to like, you know, take, take the like sharp knife of like cut things out of like, you don't, there's no rule that says that you have to do all the extracurriculars, all the things you committed. Like you've committed to that. You've chosen those, I think, because you think they're meaningful or they're going to make you happy. And if you really have done that to the point that like, your time affluence is at zero and you're like, you know, extracurricular affluence or wealth affluence or whatever is super high, then, you know, the data might suggest that you need to like, you know, cleave some of those off. Like there just isn't enough time in life to do all the cool things that there are to do at Yale. There's just not. And if you carve off too many of them, then you miss out on the time affluence and all these other things that are making you happy. So you're like meeting all these goals and you're like, why does this feel so stressed and so miserable? It's because you've kind of cut out the stuff that your mind didn't tell you was important to put in there, but it really is.